Jesus is our king, and king of our personal lives, king of the church, but also king of the world, lord of the universe. Uh, all things are meant to be under his submission and his authority. As you know, the uh, disaster in Haiti was a natural disaster, but it was also a human disaster. It was a disaster of poverty. It was the result of poverty that the death and destruction was to such an extent and the hampering of relief efforts was so difficult. For years, uh, we have been seeking and searching of how else can compassion help the church to rise up and be the church. Most of you know that when Wes became president, uh, very shortly after, God spoke to him in a, in a very unusual way and challenged him to say, what about the rest of them? That yes, compassion might grow to one million children or two million children, and now we're even thinking maybe four million children. And that is fantastic. But what about the rest? It's too big for compassion. It's not too big for God. And it's not too big for his church. His church is poised and ready. Two years ago, a group of us met in Oxford, England to seek and to pray and to strategize of how can we wake up the church? How can we mobilize this vast army that's mostly sitting in their lounge chairs to do the job, to finish the job, to make it happen? And we've been dreaming and seeking and praying since that time and also working. And today you're going to hear what some of that's all about. You're going to hear about the starting of a new movement, of fanning the flames of the church to rise up, to take it to the streets, to make thy kingdom come as we pray every Sunday in most of our churches. One of those who was with us in Oxford was Dr. Scott Todd, and most of you know Scott. Um, Scott's one of my dear friends. We work closely together, one of the people I respect most in this world. Um, Scott came to us uh, from a promising career in medical research, and God just called him out. It's one of those great stories. He went from leading a big fancy research team with huge government grants and going to find the cure to cancer. Um, to being an advocate, to saying, God is calling me to speak up on behalf of the poor. In his time with Compassion, he's worked on the communication side, the marketing side. He's worked on the program side. He's worked in the middle in the MI2 kind of space of developing products and programs that go together. And recently, he's been a part of the executive office representing Compassion externally and challenging us in our thinking and our planning and our our understanding of what we're trying to do internally. I charged Scott a couple years ago. I said, I want you to lead some substantive thought at Compassion. And he's done that. Uh, we've been having more and more substantive thought, both about our, our role in our ministry, but also about this much bigger thing that God is doing in his church. Uh, we see it popping up all over, and it's exciting. And our goal is to continue to fan the flames of that movement that's taking off around the world. Our chapel series this year is going to start building that case. And we are going to have Christian leaders, Christian speakers throughout this year coming and sharing with us some of their heart for that. And we're, we're going to be filming a number of them and hopefully using pieces of that in this film. Scott just came back from Haiti. Uh, he's been there helping our heroic staff on the ground reach out to the needs of kids. Most of you know we operationalized a medical team to go and provide some, some short-term medical care. Um, he's here today to share some of what God's been placing on his heart and mind about the call of the church, of what we are called to do. Because poverty is not just a blight on this planet. Poverty is, 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 is a condemnation on the church of what we have failed to do, where we have failed to be light and salt in the city on the hill. 
Since Oxford, God has continually and repeatedly brought Isaiah 58 before us. 3,000 years ago, the prophet spoke to the people of Israel. And this wasn't the comfort, comfort thee, my people part. This was, you're wrong. My people, you're wrong. And you need to repent, and you need to confess, and you need to understand that your faith is not a personal piety thing. Your faith is your life. It's how you live. And Isaiah 58 is our theme for this chapel. It's our theme for the film. It's our theme for the church. It's alive and active today. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Well, good morning, Compassion. I have been looking forward to this day for a long time. I, uh, I've been excited about this day and... Uh, you know, I had planned all of last week that I would really prepare <laughs> to give this speech. And uh, last week, I was, I was not able to do that. I was in Haiti and um, uh, didn't sleep much, uh, pretty difficult trip. So if I look a little uh, bleary and haggard uh, this morning, well, it's because I always look that way. And those of you, <laughs> you get up close, you realize that's just as good as it gets. It's not going to get better. <clears throat> and if my thoughts are a little jumbled uh, this morning... Um, I can't really blame Haiti for that either. I, uh, have you ever gone to get on an elevator and you're standing there waiting for it to come and uh, it just seems like it's taken forever and you're getting kind of impatient and then uh, you realize you never push the button? <laughs> that's, that's me. I've done that. And here's, here's what you do when it happens to you. You, you kind of take a look around and make sure nobody was really seeing that and I think I'll go up now. <laughs> Well, the reason that came back to me was I, I, I'm, I'm imagining some of you have done that before, but I bet none of you have done what I did two weeks ago. I was in Thailand, actually, when I got the call to immediately turn around and come back to put together this medical team and head to Haiti. And, uh, you know, we were, we were arriving late into Los Angeles and had to overnight there, so I check into the hotel, got on the elevator, actually pushed the button and everything, but then I'm standing in the elevator and I realize that I had gone up to my floor, the door had opened and closed, and I was still standing inside. <laughs> Forgot to get off. Now, I know you're worried about me. You're like, and we trust this guy to, <laughs> to do stuff? <clears throat> yeah, so I am praying this morning that somehow, despite my muddled state of mind, uh, I have about 10 hours worth of 
of stuff I want to say, and my thoughts and my emotions are just kind of a traffic jam in me right now. I'm praying that God will somehow take whatever comes out of my mouth and translate that into the words that He would have you hear. And I believe that He will do that. I, I really do believe that the message that we have is a message from Him and that it's a message that is critical, it is vital for us and for His church to hear. And so it's my prayer that that will happen this morning. I want to thank all of you for praying for me and for the team as we were in Haiti and continuing to pray for me even this morning. I'd like to especially thank my wife, Bethany, who's here this morning. Um, let's give it up for... She's, you know, I have four boys at home, and so people are like, uh, do you have any experience in disaster uh, response? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, she holds down the fort, and she's been such a pillar of strength um, through what's been a pretty challenging time for us. And so, anyway, the, the medical team and, and what we saw last week, I, you know, I, I had certain things I was going to talk about this morning, but I can't be here without telling you a few things from last week. Um, we treated over 500 patients, saw a lot of broken bones and a lot of injuries, a lot of infected wounds, and uh, it was a tough week. And there are just two, two stories, two uh, people who really have stuck with me, and I'm going to share their stories with you briefly. The first is about a little girl named Falon. We have a picture of her. And uh, Falon is one of our Compassion-sponsored kids, and she was um, in her home with her two sisters and her father when the quake hit. The house collapsed, killed her father, killed her sister. The other sister got uh, injured but survived. And Falon, somehow, when the, when the walls came down, they trapped her hand in the fire. You know, the family often cooks inside the home. For two hours, her hand was pinned in that fire. Her mom, you know, of course, comes racing home and, and digs her out. And uh, this is the picture of her hand. And I know that's hard to look at, and I debated this, but I thought, you know what? She has to look at that. And... I'm going to spare you the images, the countless other images that we saw, but that's, that's the kind of stuff we were seeing and treating last week. The other person I'd like to tell you about is someone who uh, Edouard prayed for. His name is Rejour. Um, Rejour is uh, one of our, our staff in Haiti. He's a driver, a uh, messenger. Um, he doesn't make a lot of money. And uh, his daughter... Um, was sort of, as, as Edward said in his prayer, his, his hope for, the, for his future. She was this rising star. She was at the university studying to be a doctor. When the quake hit, it collapsed on her. Rejour raced to the university, and he actually was able to find her, but she was trapped under the rubble. And so he heard her crying out, Daddy, Daddy, I'm here come get me. And he would respond, I'm here, baby. I'm here, baby. Just hang on. For two days. For two days, he dug, and he rescued six others in the process, but he couldn't get her. I run out of tears over that. I just, it, oh, it rips me up, and I just think, There's a time when, when sadness isn't enough. You move beyond sadness. You move to anger. You get to that point where you say, you know, I know that's, I know that's dangerous. We talk about righteous anger. And I think 99% of the time when Christians talk about righteous anger, they're, they're probably masking something. But there are times. There are times when Christians need to rise up and say, this will not happen in my world. And maybe you're thinking, Scott, what are you going to do, stop an earthquake? But you're missing the point. David said it earlier, this disaster was a disaster about poverty. It was a disaster about poverty. You know, in 1994, there was a quake of similar magnitude that hit Los Angeles, right in the, in the greater Los Angeles area. Now, L.A. is a city of 13 million people, 13 times greater the population than Port-au-Prince. The quake that hit Port-au-Prince actually didn't hit in the center of Port-au-Prince. It was outside by about 13 miles. The quake in L.A., 60 people died. Haiti, 200,000. They died because they were too poor to have rebar in their concrete. 
They died because of the lack of infrastructure. They died because they're buried under the rubble and they didn't have the big machines to dig them out. You know, my kids heard about David Ames. They'd say, Dad, why don't they just get in there with some of those machines and dig them out? It's difficult to answer that. Haiti is a disaster about poverty, and the greater tragedy will be when the American media gets bored and the story's off the front page and off the front of the minds of the American conscience, and Haiti returns to being Haiti. And that's something that we, as God's people, need to be committed to never allowing to happen. The prayers of our Haitian brothers and sisters are that somehow the God who is in the business of redeeming and the business of rebuilding, that the God who heals and who somehow can lift good out of the most horrible things, that that is what God will do with this event. And future generations of Haitians will look back at this time and remember that that was the moment where things changed, where the history of Haiti was thrown upside down. And that's got to be our prayer as well. You know, not long ago, I was at a pastor's conference, and uh, I asked these church leaders um, that were in my session, I'd handed out three-by-five cards, and I said, tell me one scripture that comes to your mind about the poor, anything you can think of. Don't have to quote it verbatim, just, just tell me what is it. You know, there's hundreds, perhaps thousands to choose from. You know what the most common answer was? The poor will always be with you. Yeah, that's right. The poor you will always have with you. Why is it that that verse, out of all that could be chosen, comes to the lead in our thinking, not just our thinking, but the, the thinking of our leaders, Christian leaders, that that's the most prominent uh, scripture in our theology of poverty, at least our common theology of poverty. The poor you will always have with you. It's not like we're actually going to solve the problem. It's just the way it is. Sure, we should help the poor and do what we can, but we shouldn't actually expect to end poverty because Jesus said the poor will always be with you almost like he ordained it that way. Well, pastors aren't the only ones who hold this view. Uh, you know, the Association of Evangelical Relief and Development Organizations is a network of 73 Christian uh, relief and development organizations, and um, it's, it's the largest network of its kind, and uh, not too long ago they made the mistake of uh, electing me to be chairman of the board. <clears throat> and, um, and we took a look at the vision and the mission statements, and we rewrote them. And the vision statement now says that we are mobilizing and equipping the Christian community to end poverty. Now, uh, as the board, we had to present that at the members meeting just two months ago. Um, so these are the leaders uh, of these 73 different Christian relief and development organizations, and we presented that statement to them, not for their vote really, but just to let them know the board had the authority to, to write those statements. And uh, there was a guy there who kind of looking around and you know, hesitantly, he's putting up his hand and um, to, to end poverty, is that, is, is that really realistic? And I was so glad that he said it, you know? I was so glad that he had the courage to say it because it did take courage for him to say that. And I was glad because I knew that that question was on the minds of a lot of the others that were in that room. And I would suspect that a lot of you probably have that same question. You look at the size of the problem and you're you're just a bit skeptical about, is it really realistic? I mean, these, these campaigns, these things like end poverty now, make poverty history, aren't those more like slogans? You know, they're, they're good for being idealistic statements. They're good for mobilizing Christian engagement. They, but they're not really to be taken seriously, you know? I mean, that that would be something we really expect. And so the fact that he said that, though, made me, made me realize that it's not just our leaders in the church, our pastors and our church leaders who have this mindset that the poor will always be with you and that's just the way it is, but it's even the leaders of those organizations that God has called to relief and development work and to fight against poverty. And so this becomes something that I think is critically important, that we understand what is the root of that thinking. You know, many of us have stories that have affected us, people that we've met, events that have happened in our lives. I've told you before about this girl, Jacqueline and uh, how my time with her really shaped me. Jacqueline's parents both died of AIDS. Uh, she was in the care of her grandmother. Uh, she herself was infected with HIV. And three months prior to my visit, she was doing pretty well, but she had deteriorated rapidly in those three months. And so when I met her, uh, you know, she was right on the edge. And I had a lot of hope because I knew we'd arranged finally for her to have access to the medicines that she needed. And I knelt down and I prayed with her 
And, uh, you know, I really believed that God was going to allow this life to be one of the first in Africa, in Tanzania, to receive this therapy and uh, that we'd watch her grow up. Um, but that wasn't how the story turned out. Uh, before I got back to the States, she had died, even though we did respond. And I've always felt that we were just this close, maybe a day. Jacqueline, you could say she died from AIDS. She died from poverty. She died because she didn't have access to the medicines that would save her life. I wrote a letter to Jacqueline, and I promised her in that letter I would do everything I could with whatever influence God gave me that we would not be too late again for the other children. And so today, and this message is also for me personally a part of keeping that promise. You know, as David mentioned, we met in Oxford to, uh, to seek God, and this Isaiah 58 was really laid upon our hearts. And we also had in mind, um, how do we communicate that most effectively? And that's where this idea of producing a film uh, came up. And so we've been calling the film 58, and it's a message of, of Isaiah 58 for our time, for our generation. And, uh, you know, um, one of the first places that we went to film was this quarry in India. And I have a shot of that quarry. You might have seen this before. This quarry was dug entirely by hand. And... Uh, some of the people working in this quarry are children. These kids spend all of their hours of the day hammering away at rocks because they're held there as bonded servants, really as modern day slaves under a debt structure where the quarry owner both controls their wages and has, lended, has loaned them money. They needed money for things to escape poverty. The boy is, is Gopi. This particular boy, his grandfather was trapped in poverty and borrowed money from a quarry owner. His father tried to work his way out but couldn't because the interest rate's 120% and they never pay you enough to even, even dent that interest, uh, I mean, uh, to, to dent the, the loan amount. And so when needs come up, they're, they're forced to borrow again. And so I spent uh, these days in the quarry with, the, with Tony and Tim and others who are here, the, the film crew. And for those days, I, I just was building that anger. These kids are trapped in this quarry. Yes, it's due to corruption. Yes, it's due to greed. And, and there's a lot that's wrong. But ultimately, the vulnerability that led to this is poverty. It's poverty that keeps kids like Gopi trapped in those quarries. So what does our theology of poverty tell us about Gopi? The, the poor will always be with you. What does it mean for him? Kids like Gopi are just inevitable. You might rescue some, but others are unrescuable. Or girls like Jacqueline, you might, you might treat some, but others, you just can't do it. Almost like Jesus ordained this type of life in bondage for these kids. You know, after three days of being there and having that anger, I was sitting on a rock at, uh, at the end of the day, and there these people are still hammering away, and, and I'm sitting next to this man, his name was Jay Raj, and, um, and I, I asked Jay Raj about his life, about what it's like to be working in the quarry, and he told a similar story about having debt and how he had grown up in a quarry and he'd worked there. It, I asked him about his family, and he told me that he had a son, but that at age five, his son got cancer and died, and he, he actually borrowed money at that time to try to help treat his child hard life. And then he mentioned that he had a daughter. And that, uh, as I said, well, tell me about her. Now, every other guy, every other dad that I ask about a daughter, they spoke of burden. They spoke some about anxiety. They talked about how they wanted them married young or it'd be a shame on the family. They, they feared not having enough money for the dowry because if you didn't have enough money, then the, other, the, the husband's family wouldn't really give respect to this daughter. And so, when I asked Jay Raj about his daughter, he had some very different things to say. He said he loves his daughter, and he doesn't want her to get married young. He wants her to be an educated woman, that she's his hope for the future, and that he's very proud of her. All these statements that were like, wow, this is, this is really different from what I've heard from other dads about their daughters. So I looked down there into the, into the quarry pit, and I said, so which one is she? And he said, oh, she's not here. Why is that? Well, she's, she's at school, and after school, she, uh, she goes to this program that's run by a church. It's called Compassion. 
And uh, he didn't know that I worked for Compassion or that we were there, you know, we were, we were there under the banner of Prospect Arts filming this thing that was really quite separate. And I was, I was just kind of thinking, wow, I mean, I didn't expect that. Then I said, what's her name? And he said, 58. And I said, no, 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 her name, <laughs> 58. I could just feel the spirit washing over me. My skin was just alive. I was there going, what is this? Does it... No, here's her name. I'm asking her name. And we're going through a translator. I'm like, you're not getting it right. Something's... What am I hearing? He says 58. The translator's confused. And he talks to J. Raj, and he turns back to me and says, she's child number 58 from the Compassion Project. Like that's an answer. <laughs> <clears throat> so this was the first place that we went to film. I had been in there praying, God, uh, how is it that we were even able to come through the gates of this quarry? This is an illegal quarry. It is illegal in India to have children living in bonded labor and child labor like that. It was illegal for its geological reasons as well. And here, it's not like we're, you know, inconspicuous, <laughs> incognito. Yeah, we're just kind of like the rest. And you're hauling in these massive cameras, and we're a bunch of white guys. And I mean, there we are. And somehow, God had opened the, the gates to this quarry. And in that moment, that was God speaking this affirmation, this confirmation. You are here because I opened the gates of that quarry. You are here because I've heard the prayers of these children. You're here because I love them. And the time has come for their stories to be heard by my people, the people of God throughout the world. You're here to be stewards of their stories. And that moment of meeting J. Raj and hearing that his daughter is number 58, her real name is Soundarya. And that was just affirmation. That was, for me, this moment of knowing God has been before us. And I've believed that every day since. And I believe that's true today, that God has already gone before us and this message is His and that anything that we say or do, we're just servants in His hands, praying that He will use us and praying that God's people will awaken to some amazing possibilities that we've been blinded to by some lies that we've believed, some misinterpretations of Scripture. So this morning we have a short video. You will meet uh, two families in this. Um, you may have seen some of this before, but it's footage from that time in India. You will see... Uh, one family who's, who's trapped in uh, poverty and, and a man and what his perceptions are and his wife. And then you'll meet Jay Raj. And then you'll meet Soundarya. Number in the answer, Pandra there. Number than Pandra there. The water is on a caravanga. You can't allow it again. I'll caravanga on a thing. I'm <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to
வீட்டில் என்ன சந்தோஷம் இருக்குது கஷ்டப்பட்டு சாப்பிடணும் பழகிட்டுங்களை <laughs> மனதல்லி <laughs> ಆವಾಗ ಮಧ್ಯನ ಊಟಕ್ಕೆ ಬಿಡ್ತಾರೆ ಊಟಕ್ಕೆ ಬಿಟ್ಟಿ ತಕ್ಷಣ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಹೊತ್ತು ಕುತ್ಕೊಂಡು ಬರ್ಕೊಂಡು ಆಮೇಲೆ ಬೆಲ್ಲ ಹೊಡಿತಾರೆ ಕುತ್ಕೊಂಡು ತಿರ್ಗಾ ಮಿಸ್ ಬಂದಿ ಪಾಠ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಆವಾಗ ಎಲ್ಲ ಪಾಠ ಕೇಳ್ಕೊಂಡು ಸಾಯಂಕಾಲ ಬಿಡ್ತಾರೆ ನಾಲ್ಕೂವರೆ ಆಡು ಹೇಳಿದ ತಕ್ಷಣ ಒಂದು ಕತೆ ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ಕತೆ ಹೇಳೋದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಅದು ಯಾವ್ಯಾವ ಥರ ಹೇಳಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅದು ಕರೆಕ್ಟಾಗಿ ಹೇಳಬೇಕು ಡೀಟೇಲ್ ಹೇಳಬೇಕು ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಅದ ನಮ್ಮ ಕ್ರಿಶ್ಚಿಯನ್ ಆಡುಗಳು ಆಡೆಲ್ಲ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇರ್ತಾರೆ ಅಪ್ಪೋ ಹಿಂಗೆಲ್ಲ ಹೇಳ್ಕೊಟ್ರಪ್ಪೋ ಇದೆಲ್ಲ ಹಾಡು ಹೇಳಮ್ಮ ಹಾಡು ಹೇಳೋದ್ರೆ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗ ನಮ್ಮ ಕ್ರಿಸ್ಮಸ್ ಬೈಕ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಹಾಡುಗಳು ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ಏಸು ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಅಂದರೆ ನಂಗೆ ತುಂಬ ತುಂಬ ಪ್ರೀತಿ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಮತ್ತು ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸಲ್ಲಿ ಹಾಡೆಲ್ಲ ಹೇಳಬೇಕು ಅದು ತುಂಬ ಇಷ್ಟ ಹಾಡು ಹೇಳೋದಂದರೆ ಮತ್ತು ಇದೇ ಕಷ್ಟ ಒಂದು ನಮ್ಮಳಿಗೆ ಬರೋ ಮಾರು ನಮ್ಮ ಪುಳ್ಳಿಗಳಿಗೆ ಬರಕೂಡಾದು ನಮ್ಮ ಪುಳ್ಳೆ ಪಡಿಕೆ ಪೋದು ನಲ್ಲ ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಇಂಥ ಸರಿಚಲ್ ನಲ್ಲ ಸಪೋರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಪಡಿಕೆ ವಹಿಕರಾಂಗ ಪಡಿಕೆ ವಹಿಕರನಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮ ಕಷ್ಟ ಬಂದು ನಮ್ಮಳೋಡ ಹೋಗಿರ್ವೇನೆ ಪುಳ್ಳ ನಲ್ಲ ಪಡಿಚಿಟ್ಟಿರುವಂಗ 197 ಮಾರ್ಕ್ ಕಡಿತಿರುತ್ತೆ ಪುಳ್ಳ ಹೋಟ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮ ನಲ್ಲ ಪಡಿಕೆ ವೇನೆ ಒಂದು ಆಸೆ ಪುಳ್ಳ ಇನಕ್ಕೆ ನಮಗೆ ನಂಬ ಇಷ್ಟ ನಲ್ಲ ಪಡಿಕೆ ವಹಿಕನ ಪುಳ್ಳಯ ಯೇಸು ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನನ್ನ ಮುಂದೆ ನಿಂತಾಂಗ ಅವರು ಏನ್ ಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಕೇಳಬೇಕಾನೆ ನಾನು ಹೇಳೋದು ಅವಾಗ ಹೇಳ್ತೀನಿ ಮಿಸ್ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಓದಬೇಕು ಮತ್ತು ಎಲ್ಲರ ತಗೊಂಡು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಹೆಸರು ತರಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಫುಲ್ಲ ಇನ್ನು ಎಣ್ಣೆ ವೇಳೆಂಗಿರೋದು ಒಂದು ತೆರಿಲ್ಲ ಇನ್ನೂ ನಲ್ಲ ಪಡಿಚ ಪಿನ್ನಾಳೆ ದಾ ನಲ್ಲ ತೆರಿಗೆ ಎಣ್ಣೆ ವೇಳೆಗೆ ಪೋಗಲಾ ಅಪ್ಪಿಂಗಿರೋದು ಅದು ಏದೋ ಪೆರಿಯವಂಗ ಪಾತ್ರ ಸಪೋರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ನಲ್ಲ ಪಡಿಕೆ ವಚ್ಚೆ ನಲ್ಲ ವೇಳೆ ಕಡಚಾ ನಮಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ನಲ್ಲ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಅಣ್ಣ ನಮ್ಮ ಗೈಲ ಒಂದು ಇಲ್ಲ ಅದು ನಲ್ಲ ಫುಲ್ಲ ಪಡಿಕೆ ವಚ್ಚೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇಲ್ಲಿಲ್ಲ So you can imagine how we felt just sitting next to a guy on a rock in a quarry and this is girl number 58 and I thought what does it mean that Isaiah 58 is is embodied in this girl the daughter of a of a, a slave working in a quarry in India um I think God is speaking to us in that but you know this story is hopeful as it is as amazing as it is to discover this girl who loves Jesus and who shares about him with her father uh to know that and I believe with all my heart that she would be trapped in slavery and working in that quarry if it weren't for compassion to know that 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 happened because of what you all do the ministry that you're a part of I mean there's a lot of joy and a lot of celebration in that but at the same time there's a huge tension in this story for me because Gopi still in the quarry and as big as we got as we got big enough to reach her but we weren't big enough to reach gopi yet we've gone a long way but we haven't gone far enough 
That vision that was given to Wes about what about the rest of them is embodied in that edge, that boundary between reaching Sundaria and not reaching Gopi, at least not yet. And when I look at Isaiah 58 and that verse that was just shown, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke and set the oppressed free and break every yoke? I mean, what are those chains? You could point to a lot of things. You could point to corruption, and that certainly is one of those chains. You could point to disease, and we've talked about that. But I believe that one of the biggest chains that is binding us and that is hindering us in our fight against poverty is the belief, the fatalistic belief that the poor you will always have with you. This is just the way it is. I think we hide behind that lie. I think we find comfort in it. And so today we're going to take that chain and we're going to bow it to smithereens. You knew that was coming. <laughs> it makes me so angry to see that God's people are sitting on the pile of cash that could make the difference and sitting there saying, it's just not feel realistic. It's just not, it's just not possible. The poor are always going to be with you. Jesus said it. Well, you know what? When people say the poor will always be with you to me, I say, no, they won't. I say, no, they won't. And they're like, oh, no, I'm sure it says it in here somewhere. And they get out their Bible and they'll start flipping their pages and they'll go right through all the Old Testament laws about how God's uh, commands about economics and caring for the poor. They'll go past all of that stuff and they'll slip right on into Matthew. Uh, uh, they'll skip past Deuteronomy, one of these verses that's very important to look at, where it says, there should be no poor among you, for in the land I am giving you as your inheritance, I will richly bless you. There should be no poor among you because I will give you enough. You'll have enough. There should be no poor among you because I will richly bless you. And He has blessed us, and we need to see that blessing. They'll skip on into Matthew, they'll, they'll dangerously close to Matthew 25. We don't want to be there. But in Matthew 26, here it is. They'll say, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. It's here. It's in red. It's Jesus. Case closed. <laughs> so, I want to talk to you about what really happened that night. What really happened that night when Jesus said these words? What was going on? Because if we don't get this right, we could be in trouble. It's Tuesday night, three days before Jesus is going to be crucified. He's in the town of Bethany, very close to Jerusalem. He's been heading toward Jerusalem for some time. Now, Bethany is that city where he raised Lazarus from the dead, right? And uh, his reputation was out there. He'd seen, uh, there's a lot of notoriety, a lot of interest. And so he was in the home of Simon the leper, probably one of the lepers that he had healed. And this party is being thrown in honor of Jesus. So you can imagine the mood at this party. I mean, here's Jesus. Lazarus is at the party. You know, Lazarus came back from the dead. I'm sure he's quite happy. His, his sisters, Mary and Martha, are at the party. You know Mary, the one who would rather sit and listen to Jesus than do the dishes with her sister. Simon the leper, there, there are people who are there who were healed, who, who felt Jesus' love, who, were, who received his physical ministries. And you can imagine this party was full of celebration, of just enjoying that time with Jesus. It was a party in his honor. But at the same time, it was just a few days before his death. And I got to believe that his disciples sensed the burden that Jesus was carrying as he moved closer to that. And so Mary comes into the party with her alabaster jar of perfume, breaks it, and anoints Jesus. The whole house is filled with the fragrance of this perfume. It's a moment of worship. It's a beautiful moment. Jesus says, she's done a beautiful thing for me. And he also says, she's done this to prepare me for my burial. In that moment of worship, someone objects. You might think it'd be Martha. <laughs> you know, I mean... Sisters share things. This was a very expensive jar of perfume. I mean, it's bad enough she doesn't do the dishes. Now this. She gets a $45,000 jar of perfume and she dumped it on a man. But it wasn't, Mar it wasn't Martha. I think Martha was in on the plan. It was Judas. Judas Iscariot. Matthew's account says he was indignant. Why this waste? Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. 
and the per capita income for uh, the U.S. is $45,000. That's where I got that number. Why this waste? John tells us why Judas said that. He didn't say it because he cared about the poor. He said it because he was keeper of the purse. And as keeper of the purse, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Judas had a relationship with money. And when he saw that moment of worship, all he could see was that money dripping on the floor. So does Judas, uh, when Jesus sees that, Jesus sees the heart of Judas. And that is when Jesus turns to Judas and says, depending on which account you read, why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. You see, that's Matthew's account. In, in, uh, or, or I think it's John's account. In, in Matthew's account, it's one sentence. It's, the poor will always be with you, but you will not always have me. You want to know how I know that Jesus did not say the poor will always be with us? He wasn't talking to us. Because in Matthew 26, he says, the poor will always be with you. And you flip a couple pages. In Matthew 20, 28, he gives us the promise, I will be with you even to the very end of the age. That's a promise you can hang on to for all time, right? It's not like Jesus was in the middle of that moment of worship and saw Judas objecting out of this greedy heart and said, one day the Roman Empire will fall. The age of reason will come, and one day a nation called America will be born, and they'll put a man on the moon, and they will no longer speak with their voices. They'll transmit their thoughts directly through their fingers into electronic pulses that'll bounce off metal in the sky, and they'll call it tweetering or twittering or, or <laughs> blogging or something, but whatever. The point is, the poor will always be with you. I know that's a little odd. <laughs> he didn't do that, but why do we imagine it like that? Why do we imagine it like an all-time statement? I think the sooner we recognize that Jesus did not ordain poverty, didn't say that this is inevitable, didn't say that children should die in these circumstances that we've described, the sooner our leaders can take this chain off their minds and begin to realize there are some real serious possibilities here. You see, when our theology of poverty begins with a fatalistic view like that, it hinders, it hinders us severely. Now, I know maybe that answers some theological questions. Maybe you're going, okay, so Jesus didn't, you know, he was speaking to, the, to Judas or maybe the people in the room. He was saying that's their last chance to worship him in person and not, you know, a forever all-time statement. But you're still a realist, and I'm a realist too. Many of us are skeptics, and, and that's okay. It's good. Well, last week I was uh, talking with a man named Janu, Haitian man. He was serving as my translator and driver. I was also with Magdalene. Magdalene is a, a nurse there in Haiti. And so I asked him, I said, Janu, do you think it's possible that there could be a future in which there's no more extreme poverty? I mean, this kind of poverty. We're looking out the windows of the truck at all the devastation. This kind of poverty where basic needs are not met. People are hungry and have no safe shelter. I'm not talking about spiritual poverty and all the, the metaphors that we often use. You know what he said? Real simple. He didn't even hesitate. He said, yeah, I think it's possible. It's just a matter of choices. I heard that if the world would spend one quarter of what it spends on its military budgets, we could get it done, feed people and educate the children and everything. And Magdalene agreed. I didn't have it in me to tell him, actually, it's a lot less than a quarter of the world's military budget. If our Haitian brothers and sisters can believe that it's possible, even in the aftermath of that disaster, who are we? to doubt that it's possible. If they can say it's just a matter of choices, who are we to say it isn't realistic? You know, another woman that I've met and who's had a tremendous impact on my life, her name is Mari. Um, Mari told me about what it's like to live in a, in a one-room home with no electricity, what it's like to do without a refrigerator, and what it's like to not have access to a medical care, basic health services. She had two daughters. She had uh, the first one with, without any problems, but the second daughter um, was what they called a blue baby. Ever heard of that? Yeah, blue baby is when mom has a uh, negative blood type and the baby has a positive blood type, and so mom's immune system begins to attack the baby's red blood cells, and hence it's blue. And uh, they often don't survive, but this blue baby did survive. And it's really important to me that the blue baby survived because... That blue baby was my mom, and Mari is my grandmother, 
and she doesn't live in a one-room house without electricity or a refrigerator anymore. She's a millionaire. A lot changes. The world is changing. Two generations can bring about staggering change. Now, the time has come to unveil the truth about what's going on in the world, to see what has happened in a generation, and to begin to, to imagine what is possible in our generation. This is the state of the world in 1810. This is data. I know you know I'm, I'm big on data, and here it is. We've got, we've got some, some things to talk about here. I hope you can see it, but on this axis down here is the income per capita, how much money people are making. And on this axis over here, you've got life expectancy. So 200 years ago, pretty much everybody in the world is living at about 30 years. If you'd lived then, most of you'd be dead. <laughs> yeah, 200 years ago. Four generations ago, pretty much everybody in the world. Now, those dots represent countries. The larger the dot, the bigger the country's population. So, for example, as you start to look at what happened in the past 200 years, you've got China sitting right here, and all these orange ones, those are your European countries where industrialization starts to happen here in the mid-1800s. And there goes the United States, even in spite of civil war, we're taking off, we're starting to kick out the Europeans in the lead. Very cool. China's still kind of languishing back here. All these blue dots are your uh, sub-Saharan African countries. But look at this. You get into World War I and II, and the whole world begins launching up here, making more money, living longer. And now, when you get to 2007, nobody anywhere in the world is having an average lifespan where we were 200 years ago. And many of us are up here living 70 to 80 years. A lot has changed in those 200 years. Now, I know that was kind of crazy. It was a lot to, to see. So... Um, Let's look at it again with just a few countries. What's going to happen? Down here you have Ethiopia and Brazil and South Korea. Up here you have Australia, the United Kingdom, the United States. We're going to see who wins. So <laughs> here goes Australia, the little red guy. The little red guy is catching up in terms of lifespan. The United States is getting out there. Uh, you, you might have noticed these big drops. This was World War I. Uh, what? Look at this. South Korea is taking off. South Korea wins in lifespan. But even Ethiopia... Look what's happened in Ethiopia recently. It's gone from an average of 30 years lifespan up here to about 55, and just beginning, you know, health often precedes income, and so they're just beginning this trajectory, this direction. Look at Brazil. It's flying. Now maybe you're thinking, well, you're picking some exceptional countries. I, okay, let's keep looking at it. What about the kids? It's one thing to talk about lifespan and, and income. What's happening to children? This is going to show you uh, three countries, actually. We'll start out with just Brazil in yellow and Thailand here in red, but after uh, four years or so, Ethiopia will show up here as a blue dot. On this axis now, we're looking at how many kids die before their fifth birthday, and on this axis, we're just looking at time. Very simple. So over time, what's happening to the child mortality rate, the under five child mortality rate? So back two generations ago in 56, you've got uh, 20% of the kids born in these countries dying before their fifth birthday. That's 200 out of every 1,000. Yeah, Ethiopia will show up here shortly and uh, at a much higher rate. But let's see what's been happening in the past two generations. You see, we used to say 40,000 kids die every day from hunger and preventable disease. And then we would say 30,000. And now we're saying what? 24,000. What's happened in Thailand? What's happened in Brazil? Even in Ethiopia, it lags out here during the 80s when there was that famine and there was a very corrupt government. But now look what's happened since, since the 90s. Look where it's all headed. Fewer kids are dying from preventable causes for, because of the result. It's the result of some amazing development work that's been going on. But we don't really want to talk about that. I don't know why. We're going to talk about it now. Let's keep looking at some more uh, examples of this. We're just looking at, again, at child mortality. Now, this is one of the Millennium Development Goals, to reduce the number of kids who die from preventable causes. The world in 1959, we had about 100 million kids that were born, right? So that's the size of that bubble. And on average, globally, 150 out of 1,000 of those would die. So 15 million of those 100 million would die before their fifth birthday. Average income was around $3,000 a year. If you explode that world out and you look at countries in two categories, the blue one's up here, 
are your developing countries, so-called, and then the orange-colored ones are your industrialized countries. So that's 1959, but what's happened since then? Watch these countries as they migrate through time. There's two big ones in here are China and India. And you can see that in two generations' time, many of the countries that were up in that higher uh, bubble are now where we were two generations ago. Incredible progress that's been made. So, in order to reach the goal of the Millennium, millennium Development Goal number four, we need to see an average improvement in child death rates at 4.3% per year. That's this down here. These countries are on track to reach that goal, the ones that are shown in green here. These others, shown in yellow, are making progress, but it's insufficient to reach the goal. And we have a handful that are still in red, not making sufficient progress. One of those yellow countries is Tanzania, the country where Jacqueline uh, lived in and where she passed away. So just looking at Tanzania, for example, what's happened there? Why is it yellow? Well, look what happened. From 90 to about 98, they made no progress. But then look what happened from that point. 10% reduction per year. Why? They doubled their health budget, they expanded immunizations, they distributed bed nets to prevent malaria. Malaria is one of the big killers of, of children in, uh, in Africa. Look what we're doing with measles, a vaccine-preventable disease. In 2000, we were losing about 800,000 kids a year due to this vaccine-preventable disease of measles. Since then, we've cut it by 75%. Only 200,000 now. Still 200,000 too many, but it's tremendous progress. Insecticide-treated net distribution is up at around 20 million. There have been uh, amazing, amazing things happening, and we haven't really been celebrating it. This is the current trend in terms of child death rate. In order to get to the goal down here, the Millennium Development Goal, this is the estimated uh, number of lives to be saved if we expand bed net distribution, improve vaccines, improve services for mothers and newborns like our child survival program is doing. So that's what it takes. It's this type of stuff that starts putting some real flesh on the question, what is it going to take? You stop debating this, well, the poor will always be with you, and is it really possible? It changes the debate, right? If you start saying, no longer are, it's like, it's like the man on the moon. You remember, uh, you might not remember, I don't remember, but Sputnik went up, right? And the Russians were ahead. And Kennedy's looking at that and he says, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. That simple. You know, all those NASA engineers, they, the, before they were probably sitting around debating, well, boy, is it really worth it? And I'm not even sure if it's possible and all that. And then your leader steps up and says, we're going to do it. We're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The debate changes. They start asking, how? What's it going to take? And that's the kind of thinking that we can change when we look at these, uh, these things. I'm going to show you what's happening to global poverty itself. The number of people living in extreme poverty, that's below $1.25 a day, the new World Bank standard. This is in one generation. First, you see India. 65% of the population of India is living in extreme economic poverty in 1978. China, 86% living in extreme economic poverty in 81. And Ethiopia, right around 65%. Would you look at that? China's dropped from 86% to 16%. India has dropped 20% of the numbers living in poverty. And Ethiopia, even Ethiopia, look at this curve that's happening right around 2000. People are rising out of extreme economic poverty. We have some more uh, data, a few graphs here that I'd like to show on these side. This is global poverty in the blue line from 1800 to today. You can see back in 1800, pretty much everybody was living in economic poverty without basic needs met. And today that number's down to 25. If you look at the next slide, you see it by region. Asia showing the most progress. And Sub-Saharan Africa is the only place which is still languishing. It's still behind. It's shown a little progress in the past five years, but that's really where we need to be focusing for the future. And the next slide shows you what a generation can do. A generation ago, we had 52% living in extreme economic poverty. And today, we're at 26%. If the last generation reduced it by 26%, if we can do the same, we will end it. 
Stuff like this is what leads economists like Jeff Sachs to say things like ending extreme poverty is a practical, achievable objective, and it is, that can be completed by our generation. That is not an idealistic statement. That is being said by a guy who is looking at the numbers. I don't know about his faith, but it strikes me, it concerns me that an economist from a strictly secular perspective can say that it's possible, while those of us who believe in the all-powerful God would somehow doubt that it's possible. But let me say one more thing. It is not inevitable. You might look at these trends and begin to think, oh, well, we're almost there. But it's not inevitable. And Martin Luther King Jr. has a great quote on this. It says, he says, human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tire tireless efforts of men who are willing to be co-workers with God. And that's going to have to be true here as well. I'm going to show you something that illustrates the point of that. This is North Korea as in South Korea in 1961. On this axis is the number of children dying before their fifth birthday. This axis is the income. So in 1961, after the, the war, is, they're kind of together. A uh, very high number of children dying, probably around 17%, and uh, they're not making a lot of money. Let's look what happens in the span of, uh, of about 50 years here. They're tracking together until about 1971. Here goes North Korea. Suddenly, they're not making much progress in the child death rate. South Korea continues to improve. Fewer and fewer kids are dying in South Korea. North Korea starts heading back. What's the difference between North and South Korea? You could answer that a thousand ways. There's a lot of differences between North and South Korea, but ultimately, the difference is a line a latitude. It was drawn by political leaders. The cultures were the same, the human potential was the same, the language was the same. Draw a line. On this side, corrupt dictatorship. You know what happened in 1971, that branch point right there? That's when North Korea officially adopted the ideology of Genche, which means man is the master of his own destiny. And it's when this current regime, this line of dictators, uh, came into power, which was this egomaniacal, closed dictatorship. What happened in South Korea was a, dom a democracy. It allowed Christianity to flourish. Leadership matters. You could add up the number of children who died in North Korea, subtract the number of children who died in South Korea, and I believe you would have the number of kids who died due to corruption, due to bad leadership. Corruption kills. You'll hear more about that from Isaiah 58 and Bong Bong's message. Uh, very soon. So, it is looking at the data, you could say it's possible. Looking at, at uh, Scripture, you could say there's nothing that theologically opposes it. But you know what? All of that doesn't matter so much. You know what really matters? What does God want? Does God want children to die of preventable disease? Does God want children to spend their days working in quarries, hammering away at rocks in, in slavery? He doesn't want them being crushed by their homes because of inadequate housing. And if you think otherwise, get another job. <laughs> the second question is, are we willing to join Him in His work? What's it going to take? When I talk about this, about Christians rising up to defeat poverty, I'm not talking about something that's new for the Christian faith. We are walking in the path of great Christian men and women who have gone before us. We've inherited a legacy of Christ's followers. They gave their lives in sacrificial service. They spoke up, and sometimes it cost them deeply. Men and women of courage and conviction who fought to overthrow the oppressive systems and to ensure that the poor and vulnerable were protected and given opportunity. I'm talking about Christians like Wilberforce who fought to end slavery. I'm talking about Christians who fought for labor laws. We don't often recognize how Christians played an important role in women's suffrage and in the UN Declaration on, the, on, the, on Human Rights. Christians, including evangelicals, have fought for the poor and vulnerable for centuries. This is our legacy, and it can be true of us again today. We can, by God's grace and in His power, end extreme economic poverty in our generation, on our watch. But it's going to take more than just compassion. It will require a unified Christian assault against poverty that is unlike anything in our history. And that's why we're doing more than producing a film. 
We are leading a conspiracy against poverty, a conspiracy in the spirit and power of our Savior Jesus Christ and for His glory, a conspiracy that will shout it aloud and not hold back, that poverty is an aging dictator whose time has come, whose grip on the vulnerable is weakening, and that by God's grace and power, we will rid the earth of poverty so that it will terrify children no more. Love thy neighbor is not advice, it's a command. As I close, there's one more thing I'd like you to see. I skipped it in the middle. It's uh, some statistics, but hopefully we can call them up. We've seen what's happened in a generation, and those who've been here for a generation, who've been in relief and development work for that time, need to celebrate the amazing impact that's happened. But this is what it's going to take to finish the job. Look at what it's estimated, $1.3 billion to pay for the vaccines that are necessary. That can be compared to the $10.4 billion that American Christians spend on cosmetic surgery. It is estimated to cost $10 billion to provide clean water for every human on the planet. That could be compared to the $16 billion that American Christians spend on ice cream. The total cost of ending world hunger, $19 billion. Seems like a lot of money. Can be compared to the $32 billion that American Christians spend on pet food. If you take all of the things necessary to end extreme poverty and put it together, the estimated cost by Jeffrey Sachs is $73 billion per year, and that might seem like a lot of money, but that, in comparison to the $5.2 trillion per year that American Christians earn, is 1.5%. That? We can't come up with that. You know, some people look at that and they get very discouraged. It's kind of depressing. It's like, well, you know what? I look at it and I'm encouraged by it because I think if people only knew we're not asking them to go sell all. We're asking them to give a little. That is so achievable. We wonder why we haven't done it already. Because we haven't shouted aloud. And this is the truth. These are the things that we need to look at and realize and proclaim to God's people around the world because if they will step up, this can be done by our generation. But we're not going to do it on our own. There are a lot of other organizations and efforts for this to be effective, and Compassion has a critical role to play, and we will be right in the middle of the fray, and we will be leading the effort. We have a 2020 vision, and I believe with all my heart that God will allow us not only to reach those four million, but that He will allow us to surpass that. But I further believe that when our generation's time is served, we'll look back at that 2020 vision and we'll say, well, that was nothing. Did you see what God was really up to? 
Bishop John Ruciana spoke to us once and he said, compassion has a million little partners in the fight against poverty. I love that statement. Compassion, we're a million strong and we're getting stronger still. They will remember we were here.